And now our final panel on the lessons learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll turn it over to Juliet Cayenne. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to moderate this panel, which is essentially about lessons learned with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, in so many ways, as those of you who've been listening for the last five hours, uh, the crisis was unique, not least of all, because we came so close to the brink of disaster. It has captured our imagination, our fears, our academic insights, and thoughts for half a century now. Its legacy, though, isn't simply about a moment in time, a group of men, a struggle between superpowers. Uh, it is also about today and the challenges this nation faces. There are lessons to be learned about policy formation as well as the government deliberative process. It is no coincidence that I sit here with Graham Allison, uh, who changed how we think about decision making and his historic essence of decision. And in many respects, the lessons learned did not take 50 years to unearth. President Kennedy's speech before the American University in June of 1963 was proof that the Cuban Missile Crisis also changed him. So we will spend this time unearthing what has been learned, whether they are the right lessons, and how best to think about the challenges we face today in light of the crisis. And the two people who are probably best uh, to go through this exploration are Ambassador Nick Burns and Professor Graham Allison. Uh, from the panel, you may think that the Kennedy School has a monopoly on the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think it's more true uh, that it shows that a school that exists to train the next generation of leaders is destined to treat the Cuban Missile Crisis as the most significant lesson in what constitutes, in Graham's book, uh, as he so rightfully states, the essence of decisions. So let's begin with uh, some of those decisions. Graham, if I could start with you about the mythology about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the legacy of that mythology. We tend to think about that America stood strong and Russia folded. And that is, over the years, been proved to be a little bit more complicated. How has that mythology, though, tied and that belief that sort of Russia folded and America stood strong, how has it tied the hands of future presidents, in particular this one, um, or the next one, um, and, and then focusing on our policy options with Iran and China or any other threat today? Thank you very much, and it's a great opportunity to be here at the JFK Library and the great resources that it's made available. And I think their website is fantastic, and the material that the library is making available on this occasion for those of us who are historians and analysts, but I think also as citizens, to get back into the picture and feel something that's uh, that long ago. And from the discussion today, from those that have been here, I think you've had a great opportunity to see how this is a lively conversation still about an iconic event, the most dangerous moment in recorded history, and why, therefore, continuing to look at it and think about it and ask what the lessons are has been compelling for every president of the U.S. since Kennedy and for uh, other leaders as they try to think about it. So Julie's exactly right that we continue studying this because it's fascinating in itself, but also because there are lessons that are very relevant for issues that we have today. So Julie, to your specific question, the, uh, there emerged immediately after the crisis a narrative which actually the Kennedy administration was quite enthusiastic about and played a significant role in, in, in maintaining and sustaining, which was that the U.S. found, the mis the, found Khrushchev attempting to sneak missiles into Cuba. Kennedy confronted him publicly. He drew a clear red line. He flexed our military muscles. He hung tough. And as the most quoted line, we were eyeball to eyeball, and the other guy just blinked. Now, this was half of the story, at least, <laughs> and, and an important half. But it, it I think, uh, obscured the fact that there was another half of the story, which was crafty, extremely crafty, stealthy, sometimes even deceitful, but always masterful diplomacy, which was a huge part of this. And then that including concessions. So a concession over US missiles in Turkey, which Khrushchev pointed to as essentially equivalent to the missiles in Cuba, which they were, even though we denied that they were. They had been put in there publicly, and the, in the case of Cuba, Khrushchev was trying to sneak them in secretly. But other than that, they looked rather similar. Kennedy was prepared to eliminate those, 
as part of the whole package to get out of a crisis that, as I think, came across very well in the, pre in the previous panel, that was getting out of control, thinking that, my God, who's in charge of this? Is this going to end up rolling to a, to a nuclear war that I can't pull back? And Khrushchev actually, uh, as Sergei uh, uh, knows very well, coined, I think, one of the best metaphors of this, that we should be careful. We're pulling on this two strings of a rope, and we're going to tie a knot so tight that the two of us cannot untie it. So I think that this combination of things was crucial in this instance. And I think that because of the, the mythology is a little bit more in the John Wayne style. Yeah. You know, you confront the guy at the, uh, at the crossroads. If you're tough and you look him in the eye, you can stare him down. But actually, in fact, it was resolved by a much more intelligent process. And I think the, the lessons that Nick has been pushing us to all think about is diplomacy is not some alternative to all the rest of this. Diplomacy is actually the orchestration of all of this that was in this instance essential, but that we tend to neglect given that it's kind of easier to tell the John Wayne story. Do you want to follow up on that? I'd be happy to. And first, let me thank the library and Tom and Amy for this invitation. Uh, I must say to you, it's a real pleasure to be in this uh, this podium with two Kennedy School colleagues, Juliet certainly, but also Graham. Uh, if you're looking at the most insightful American on the Cuban Missile Crisis, he's right there. He wrote the greatest book uh, that the United States has seen, certainly, in, in essence, a decision published in 1971. Um, and I think he, Graham has, has made this a major focus of our efforts at the Kennedy School of Government. This ought to think about the implications here. And I just pick up on Graham's point by saying this. This was a negotiation during these 13 days. It wasn't just a military standoff. It was a decision about whether or not we were going to go to war and whether or not we'd, we'd try to entertain the possibility of thinking about a nuclear conflict. Graham has said that the death toll could have risen to hundreds of millions of people on both sides of the divide. And I think the crucial, the, the crucial lesson here for us is to understand that in negotiation, Unless you're trying to vanquish the person across the table or at the other end of the phone line, unless you want to win a 100 to nothing victory, you're going to have to compromise. And when President Kennedy made that faithful agreement that he would essentially trade Jupiter missiles in Turkey in exchange for the uh, withdrawal of Soviet missiles in Cuba, most of the people on the executive committee at the cabinet level of briefing President Kennedy and and Robert Kennedy had no idea this offer was being made. But in my mind, he saved us. President Kennedy saved us from a nuclear catastrophe, as did Premier Khrushchev. So what's the lesson here? And how might we apply it, say, to Iran? Because we're facing, unfortunately, at least the possibility of a war with Iran in the next couple of years. If we're not trying to destroy Iran, if we're not trying to win a complete victory, you do have to leave your adversary exit doors in your negotiation. You've got to help your adversary stand down, appreciate his or her political situation, as President Kennedy appreciated what Khrushchev was up to in his own system. And in Iran, there must be a way to negotiate our differences that leave us short of a nuclear weapon in Iran. And I think President Kennedy's wisdom in this crisis gives us that channel. So it's a, it's a central lesson to me, Julia. So let's let's talk about Iran and and, and an exit strategy since it's it's a, uh, you know in all the headlines now. What's amazing about the Cuban Missile Crisis is the extent to which um, it, it really was an intelligence failure at the beginning. Things were unknown or the known unknowns in the in the words of Donald Rumsfeld. And the president and his team, uh, as well as Khrushchev, were working with imperfect information, a lot of assumptions, lots of leaps of faith. So as you think about Iran and sort of the known unknowns or, or what we anticipate, how would you advise a president um, uh, about the lack of information we have um, drawing from the Cuban Missile Crisis and how we should factor those unknowns into our own strategic approach about about the, the issue that seems to get uh, that everyone's focused on right now? Well, again, great question and it's complicated. So I would say that on the one hand, the Cuban Missile Crisis was an intelligence success 
of a significant success, but simultaneously that there were some failures or significant unknowns, yes. which is almost always the case. The world is extremely complicated. I, I refer sometimes in class to the fog of life. <laughs> Anybody that thinks they got everything taped has probably not understood the situation. So first, the intelligent successes. Had it not been for a magical set of technological developments, we would have never known the missiles were being constructed in Cuba until after they were completed and Khrushchev had announced this is a fait accompli. So a USU-2 flying way out of sight, magically, with a camera made here in Boston, actually, by Dan Land, the land polo folks, took pictures of things on the ground uh, that nobody could even imagine that. And actually, if you look at the Soviet uh, camouflaging of these missiles as they're constructing them, they camouflage them, you know, by putting a wall around it. They're not camouflaging it from smack looking out from the sky and seeing this, because if they were looking at it from the sky, a plane would come over, you would hear it. <laughs> this thing is up there at 60,000 feet. You don't hear it coming over, and it's taking these pictures. I mean, it was genuinely magical. So I would say we shouldn't forget that. That if, if they had known that they, that they that the, about this capability, they would have camouflaged it, and we would have known. So that's the reason why getting the, he gets the chance to deliberate, as the last panel said, and think and you know prepare the first move. At the same time, as was as came up in the last panel, uh, here's Kennedy making decisions about an airstrike followed by an invasion, which was clearly his preference the first, second, third, fourth day. So as he said in the, in the video, if he had had to choose right at the beginning, he wouldn't have chosen so wisely. He would have gone with the, with the airstrike. And if you look at these new papers that uh, Tom and company have just opened uh, at the library, the, the RFK papers, you can see Bobby's handwritten comments that says, well, this is second or third day. We're going to have to go in and we have to go in hard, which means, you know, go. Okay. Well, those forces, as they come on the beaches, would have been attacked by tactical nuclear weapons, but Kennedy didn't have been over there. So you look at it and think, whoa, so now you take the Iran case. What do we know and what do we not know? Which is what you said. So about Iran, we have a pretty good picture of the fact that they are enriching uranium, they got 10,000 centrifuges, they've been operating for 10 years, they got about 7,000 pounds or 7,000. Uh, uh, seven tons of, uh, of low-enriched uranium, enough for a half dozen bombs after further enriched. Because the IAEA inspectors, the international inspectors, don't look, see, see what they So I'd say we have a pretty good picture of that. What we don't know about is any facility that has not been declared or discovered. So Ferdo, the place that the Iranians have recently been installing centrifuges deep underground, was a secret facility for four years while it was being constructed until it was discovered. So what's the likelihood that we've discovered all of the facilities in Iran that are relevant to Iran's nuclear program? I mean, I've said to, in a different context, if, that, if that's the case, the Iranian nuclear program manager should be fired. What is he, to keep all of his activity, all of his eggs under the clean lights with international inspectors coming and seeing them? So as you try to think about the airstrike option, which is on the table now for a man, one thing for sure, you cannot destroy any target that you haven't identified. So if we had attacked, as was the plan, in Cuba with the airstrikes, we would have destroyed every facility that we identified. But the tactical nuclear weapons would not have been destroyed because we didn't know they're there. So I think it's a big, big reminder this kind of known unknowns that it's extremely implausible that we have a good fix on all of the elements of this. And I think that's yet another reason why the lessons of the missile crisis relevant for Iran would suggest, just as Nick said, that, well, this, we got to find some way to reach an agreement for them to stop short of a nuclear bomb. Because our opportunities to assure that this happens otherwise are not, not very good. I think I want to follow up on that and talk a little bit where you come from, your history at the State Department and leadership at the State Department. So uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis happens. Uh, and then about six months later, uh, President Kennedy gives a speech which was as significant, perhaps, as, as any he, he gave. 
Can you tell uh, the audience a little bit about that speech? And, and as in really, how does it frame the State Department uh, in terms of their thinking about threats today or, or the challenges that, are, are, that they face as the sort of you know, key diplomatic uh, you know, uh, uh, organization for the United States? Well, I think the short answer to that question, Juliet, is there's no substitute for knowledge of history. President Kennedy studied history at Harvard College and loved to read history throughout his entire life. There's no substitute for understanding the person across from you in an adversarial relationship in international politics. And there's no substitute for wisdom. But wisdom is so elusive. You can't study at any university to get a PhD in wisdom. <laughs> you get it from your life experience, you have it or don't. And I agree with Juliet. Um, I reread the June 10, 1963 American University commencement speech this morning. I teach it uh, in the first week of all my classes at the Kennedy School. I ask the students to watch it because you, if you go on the, the library website, you can watch the speech. I think it's the most important speech given by an American president in the last 50 years. I mean, here's what that speech did. I went through it this morning. It asked us to break fundamentally from this psychology of the Cold War where we demonized each other, first. Secondly, President Kennedy made this very crucial distinction between the human interest and the national interest. Obviously, his job as American president was to pursue the national interest, protect this country, which he did quite well. But I think it dawned on him, and Graham might have a sense of this, eight months after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that the human interest was more important here, that he and Premier Chris Job might have destroyed the lives of several hundred million of us. Many of us were living in October 1962. So he's got that crucial distinction, which I think in 2012 is very important for us to remember. In an era of chemical weapons, and biological weapons, and terrorism, the human interest is paramount. Third, there's this wonderful passage in the speech, some of the most beautiful prose, I think, of any American president in our history, where President Kennedy really talks about globalization, a global world. And you all know this quote. He says, for in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We, are, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. That is the president saying to us, we are interconnected in this world. And the decisions that a powerful country like the United States makes affects everybody, and certainly he was cognizant of that in 1962 during the crisis, but especially when he reflected on it. And finally, I think a very powerful part of this speech, Juliet, the American University speech, he essentially said, we need a strategy of peace. When was the last time we heard one of our political leaders, Democrat or Republican, say, I'm for peace? You know, since 9-11, our, our leaders, quite rightly, have been saying, I'm for security. Vote for me, I'll build the walls higher. But President Kennedy, at an equally dangerous time during the Cold War, said, no, actually, the highest objective should be peace, and we Americans need a strategy for it. And he said, do not demonize. He said, I call on my fellow Americans, don't demonize the Soviet peoples. We have to see the possibility of reaching across this ideological divide and somehow connecting with them and stepping back from the psychological precipice of war, I, I just really would encourage you to have any, you know, all you need is seven minutes. <laughs> Go on the Tom Poppins website, the Kennedy Library website, and look at it. It's a powerful set of messages for us today. I, let me just pick up for a second, because I, I agree completely with what they said. And I would say if you want to do, actually, uh, Better than listening to the rest of the panel go quickly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a terrific, terrific speech. It deserves to be read and it deserves to be uh, heard. Uh, it's well delivered, but if you just read it, it just is a thrilling speech. And what, there, all the things Nick said, I agree with completely. But to go back to the last panel, I think if we said, what, it, what is the president saying now that he's thought about this over some time? Uh, that is his main takeaway from the crisis. And is it that, okay, now we know how to do this. We're smarter, we played this game, uh, I'm pretty confident we can do this again, and we'll be successful. That would be theory one, or theory two, which is, whoa, this was so dangerous, it almost got out of control. We should give thanks for the fact that we escaped in this instance, 
And we should never, never, never get into a confrontation like this again. He is in theory too. He says, let me quote, because this is, I always do for my class, he said, I say, he says, while defending our national interests, quote, we must avert confrontations that force an adversary to choose between humiliating retreat and war. So wait a minute, so we must avert crises, so we can't get into confrontations like this, that give an adversary only two choices, humiliating retreat or war. And so after the crisis, and you can see this immediately getting into his head in the immediate uh, establishment of the hotline between the U.S. and, and Moscow, so that people can talk to him, the limited test ban treaty, the beginning of the negotiations that lead to the non-proliferation non treaty, which holds back the, the spread of nuclear weapons, and then, so brilliantly in this American University speech, a president is about a very different agenda than he was before. And actually, the other piece of this that I do for my classes, Kennedy talked in that, in that context about what he called, uh, quote, the precarious rules of the status quo. It was an odd, odd phrase, but, quote, the pre precarious rules of the status quo, which he thought through the missile crisis, he and Khrushchev and their associates should learn. And these rules of the status quo were that you can't do things like Khrushchev taking such a, a brinksman's like act to put missiles in Cuba within our zone of, uh, of, of core interest, surprising people. No, that's not going to work. And actually, interestingly, because Cuba was paired with the Berlin crisis, which then was supposed to have occurred in November, but which got shelved, this became a turning point, maybe the major turning point in the Cold War, where ever thereafter, neither side took a, a, a venture as adventuresome as putting missiles in Cuba, but recognized that we gotta live together in some way, we gotta survive in some way, uh, we can't take another chance that will put us back in the confrontation that would play this hand over again. Because Kennedy thought there was a very good chance that whatever he did, this was still going to end in the nuclear war. I think that what, what both of you are describing uh, between war and peace, there's a lot of gray. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, relationships between nations that fall into that area. And so one in particular uh, today is China, obviously. Neither enemy nor ally. Uh, much more complicated than that. And Graham, you were just discussing ensuring that your enemy or your another nation has a way out uh, without humiliation and that you give options. So uh, can you talk a little bit about U.S. relationship with, with China in, in the absence of uh, Soviet Union uh, as sort of the, the double superpower? We have an emerging superpower. We have the United States you know, debating its own exceptionalism. Lots, lots more complicated than it was 50 years ago. Oh my goodness, we're going to... Uh, I, I we're we're going to travel Yeah, yeah, um, no, and I think Julian is always uh, challenging because I think thinking of the lessons of this crisis and saying, how do they apply the things on the current agenda is exactly my idea. Actually, let me give a little advertisement. <laughs> on, the, on the CubanMissileCrisis.org, if you go to that website, there's a contest for lessons of the missile crisis in which you can win an iPad. So there's three categories. There's for professionals, like professors, there's for college students, and there's for high school students. And I think the, the deadline is midnight, uh, October 16. So look at the website, there's still a chance. Uh, you can just write your lesson in, uh, with a little explanation in less than 300 words, and we and foreign policy are jointly doing this and you could win an iPad. So that, that would, you, if you can think of a better answer than the one I can for China, <laughs> that would be great. And let me go back to China for a second. So, uh, big picture for China. Uh, China's emergence over the, over, our, uh, over the last generation is the furthest, fastest growth of power on all dimensions of any state ever in history. So this is a shocker. A country that was whose economy was smaller than Spain uh, in 1980 is now the second largest economy in the world and will be the first largest economy in the world in the next decade. So, whoa. 
for Americans. Uh, I've called this the problem of Thucydides' trap. I won't give you my Thucydides lecture, but Thucydides talked about what happens when a rising power rivals a ruling power. So Athens rose, shot Sparta. He says that made inevitable the Peloponnesian War. But if you look in general, one of my colleagues, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Rosecrans, mm -hmm. has done this look. In, in 11 of 15 cases since 1500, the rising power challenges ruling power, war. So think of World War I, Germany rises, challenges Britain, war. Now, it's not inevitable. So four cases turned out okay. U.S. rose, challenged Britain, accommodation. So there's some lessons there. But in the case of uh, China, unless the U.S. and China can work out some rules, precarious rules of the status quo or some yeah. mode of accommodation, it's very likely that China will challenge things that Americans think to be our core interests or that we'll challenge things to be their core interests. And the best set of candidates for that right now, we can see every week in the paper, is the so-called South China Sea. There's a bunch of islands there. Some of them were claimed, all of them were claimed by China. Some of them, all of the rest of them were claimed by somebody else. The Japanese say the Sinkapus are theirs. The Philippines say these islands are theirs. The Indonesians say these islands are theirs. The South Koreans say these are So there's a lot of Vietnamese, a lot of competing claims. The U.S. has been the guarantor of security in that whole space. And the U.S. Navy believes we own that space. So if and as China becomes to confront and contest with one of these other countries, these islands, the question is going to be, what is the U.S. Navy going to do? If they actually the Chinese and the Japanese get into a conflict over the Sinkakos, we, the Japanese are our treaty down the lines. How are we going to become engaged? So working through some understood rules about how uh, what accommodates, and accommodates in a way that doesn't necessarily give us all of what we want, I think would be the the place to go. But Nick, Nick is our super diplomat. So Nick, how would you solve that? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. Just a minor country. Thanks for that softball. <laughs> um, I just I would add two points to what, what Grant has said. First, in a way, if there's any hope here as we look at the relationship between, between China and the United States, I don't think it's, it's nearly as dangerous as the U.S.-Soviet rivalry of the 50s and 60s. That was an ideological rivalry. And in a sense, both of us were out to win the Cold War. And that's why the American University's speech is so important. President Kennedy says we can't win. We can't try to win it because we've got to preserve humanity and, and fall short of a nuclear conflict. And I do think the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis are in the minds of every global leader that's a nuclear weapon power. And China and the United States are both such powers. That's the first one. I don't think it's as dangerous a crisis. But secondly, um, there are 193 nation states in the world. The most complicated, challenging relationship we Americans will have, certainly in the next 50 to 60 years, will be with China, because we've got this tension in our relationship. I think, Julia, it's the way you phrased it. We are friend and foe. China's our largest you know, single economic partner and will be for the foreseeable future. We're tied together economically in a symbiotic way. We can't live without each other. But on the other hand, we're strategic rivals. And so you see the United States under President Obama, I think quite rightly, the President's been very, I think, um, intelligent to say we, we ought to be pivoting our strategic attention as, as Americans to, China, to Asia. That's where we have this alliance system, South Korea, Australia, Japan, the United States are allies. We have defense arrangements with the Philippines and Thailand. We have an emerging strategic partnership with India. We're all democratic. We want to keep Asia and the Pacific democratic. At the same time, China's going to want to rise. It's going to militarily, it's going to emerge from its isolation. It's going to want to assert itself. We're seeing that in the South China Sea. So how do you have this very close economic relationship and yet have a strategic competition? We're going to have that. Can we keep the peace, avoid a catastrophic war? It's going to take wisdom and a sense of real diplomacy and of balancing two objectives that are in tension with each other. But there really is no other way to look at this because uh, we need to preserve this leading uh, strategic role for the United States. Too many people in Asia are depending on us. And one of the great ironies 
these days as Americans who travel in Asia, it's, it's one thing for the Japanese and South Korea to say, please maintain the American Navy and Air Force as the preeminent power in Asia. But when our Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, went to Vietnam a couple of months ago, they said, please visit Cameron Bay. A lot of us of a certain age remember that's where the American Navy had its hub during the Vietnam War. The Vietnamese want us to come back because the enemy and my enemy is my friend. And of course, Vietnam and China have been rivals for a thousand years. So we're seeing among all the littoral states in the South China Sea Island chains, all these countries saying to the United States, don't leave Asia. You don't know, sustain your military power because the only way to live in peace with China is to have a power in the United States that can be that balancing power. So it's critically important. And then picking up on that point, I'm going to turn to you first because uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis isn't only about substantive lessons learned, but also process issues about how a president comes to a decision making. And um, in reviewing some of the materials for this, I was um, am am amazed to the extent, you know, how Castro and Cuba's interests were essentially purposely left out of the room, that this was going to be between the two superpowers and between the two leaders. Now we're in a world of multi-nation uh, uh, multi institutions, the UN, the, and then you think about the Arab Spring, uh, uh, Arab organizations, Latin American organizations, other interests that, have, uh, that are not so easy to silence in a world in which you know, there's globalization. You can think about Israel's interest in what's happening in Iran. You can, you can sort of add these third-party interests. How, I mean, how can you manage both the necessity of that sort of tete-a-tete -tete that was so crucial to both Kennedy and Khrushchev's uh, resolution as by being open enough to, hey, this isn't a world of superpowers anymore. There are other very important interests, the Arabs or the Africans or the Latin Americans. Um, if you're advising sort of a, a new president or this president on um, um, thinking about that, that difficult balance. Well, it's a great question. I guess I'd say that you know, what was key for President Kennedy was that he had a little bit of time and space. He had 13 days. I thought bureaucratically did the right thing. He mm -hmm. lost very smart people, powerful people, but some of, some of them were rivals around one table. He said, you know, help me think this through. He was very wise to understand that some of those people may have thought more deeply about some of these strategic implications that he had time to do, but he had the decision making. And he was wise to reserve that to himself and not to make this a group exercise in decision making because, as Greg has said, the, major the vast majority of this group of very wise men at the time, I don't think there were any women around the table at the time, um, would have had us embark on a much more aggressive policy that might have led to war. And I think this is his greatest moment as, as president. It's one of the great moments in the American presidency, going back to Washington when he had enough intellectual courage in his own reason, in his own wisdom, with his brother and with Ted Sorensen and others to say, I'm going to defy the majority. I'm going to do what I think is right. And boy, was he right. And we have the benefit now of some of the historical records here at the Kennedy Library to know he was right. But the second point, Julia, Julia would be to say, we are in a different time now. We're still the most powerful country in the world, without any question. But you know, the relative power and it shifted. China and India and Brazil are closer to us, and the European Union certainly economically closer to us. So I hope we'll never have a crisis like the Cuban Missile Crisis. But when we deal with climate change, or whether to you know, assert ourselves to Syria to save people being killed there, you need to have an American leader who can reach out, who has credibility and respect in other capitals, who is broad-minded enough to want to listen to other leaders and not think that he or she has all the answers. And in that respect, and I don't want to be political today, uh, but I'll just say this. I think that President Obama is a very modern leader because as I see him over the last nearly four years, what he has done is he's gone out and broadened the American leadership circle. He has actively courted Manmohan Singh as a friend and counselor in India. He's developed very close relations with the Brazilian leadership, now a Dilma Rousseff. He's reached out I think, in a very democratic way to widen this decision-making circle. And we're going to need that in the globalized age. We can't just reserve these decisions for ourselves of war and peace and life and death. We've got to have a leadership circle, and I think President Obama's been able to build one, which gives me some hope 
that if he ended up in a crisis like this, he'd have the ability to make a wise decision. Do you want to follow up yeah. that, Brad? I agree with Nick, uh, as always, or almost always, but I would say, that, uh, to, to get back to just one uh, kind of hard go with this, in the missile crisis, uh, fortunately, as I think was rather effectively discussed at the previous panel, um, at the end there were two players, and Castro was eager to get in the game. He was frustrated as hell, but he was left out of the game. He'd been pushed aside. He was just running a location. When he had a chance to get in the game, all he wanted to do was push towards war. I think that came up quite clearly in the group. So that the success of both Kennedy and Khrushchev, in effect, of sidelining his impact on events, was frustrating to him, but fortunate for us. So uh, when Kennedy first announces that the missiles have been discovered, in his first speech, there's a, there's a chilling line that I always again quote. It says, quote, uh, uh, any attack emanating from Cuba on any target in the Western Hemisphere will be regarded by the U.S. as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring Here's the chiller, a full retaliatory response, which meant about nuclear war. Okay. So you think, wait a minute, what if Castro should be the actor? So this was basically reminding Khrushchev, these are your missiles, this is your problem, you got this thing started, and so we're holding you accountable. Now today, if you look at the Iranian crisis, well, there's us, <laughs> and there's the Iranians, but there's the Israelis. They're a totally independent actor in this picture. And you can see in the struggle that's been going on, and Nick and I have been in two days of intense meetings that just started today, or stopped yesterday at lunchtime, uh, with some Israeli friends doing this, that uh, they, as one of them said rightly, we, the no Israeli government, any strike, is going to ask the U.S. for permission to defend Israel's national security if that's what it concludes. We understand that this may have consequences, but, uh, and then similarly, the reason why the P5 plus one, that is the permanent five of the UN plus Germany, have been doing the negotiations with the man, is that they all have great stakes in this. So an American president who said, well, gee, this is complicated, I don't want to have too many actors, I'll just do this all by myself, that would be nice and clarified, but you couldn't really get around right. that today. What you also couldn't get away with um, talking about the process issue is, is 13 days. Um, it's the luxury of time, made right. decisions. Uh, uh, we were lucky to have the luxury of time. Uh, so instead of wishing that we had the luxury of time, which I don't think is going to happen, what are ways in which a president and, and his staff, a national security staff, could think about replicating the luxury of time afforded Kennedy and his ex excom uh, team uh, is that possible? My goodness, uh, we, this is one that I wrestle with all the time, and I thought actually the library did a great job with that with Kennedy video uh, earlier. Because Kennedy says, if we had had to decide quickly, we would have chosen, he didn't say the airstrike, but that's what he meant. Yeah. He said, we would not have chosen some wise things. So let's just imagine that Kennedy got in only 48 hours, and he had to make the first move and he made a decision, yeah. and he had the airstrike, and this led to a nuclear war. So, the idea of having time in private and secret to think, to deliberate, to take your first judgment, but then subject it to conflict, conflicting evidence, to competing views, to change your mind, I would say that luxury a president needs if he's going to make wise decisions. And how how to try to square that circle with the 24-7 news cycle, with pervasive press, with not just the responsible press, but all this surround. I think, uh, I mean, I think we're, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue, that's a problem. Interestingly, 
In the case of Osama bin Laden, the case that I've studied as well, there, Obama, after having heard from CIA, they've got a pretty good fix on this guy, takes four months, and he does it by, by drawing the circle so tight that most of the people who should be part of the decision process aren't really in the room. So there's a great cost to that because you're losing perspectives that you would other like to, other, otherwise would, should have as part of the consultation. But I think that the, 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 the dilemma that you point to is just right. And if you ask, well, if Kennedy had had to choose in 48 or 72 hours, maybe he would have just been a smarter, faster worker. Maybe. But maybe he would have done what he said he was going to do. If I listen to the tapes, I'm pretty confident if it has to go in 48 hours, they go with the airstrike. Did you want to follow up on that in terms of sort of the deliberative process and how fast is there? I mean, you think about, you've been very involved in your colleague about what happened in Benghazi. Um, and Biden, this is just uh, narrative uh, more than anything, but Biden explaining that the intelligence changes over time. So, uh, you know, you have a statement the first minute it is going to be different than the statement the next day, then a statement a week later. And, but we don't allow people to change, modify, accept the facts as they move. And so, you know, I find that one of the most sort of troubling differences between what you see uh, uh, Kennedy and, and his team uh, have and, and what goes on with any president now. And is there a way to, to, to try to resolve that or are we sort of doomed to it? Well, I think um, the environment in which our leaders work in, in 2012 is entirely different than the environment that President Kennedy knew in 1962. Uh, we're in a 24-hour news cycle. Uh, you have to, the first question that you now have to answer in any national security crisis in the situation in the White House is, what do we say? Yeah. And when I started my career as a lowly intern for the State Department in 1980, it was, you know, diplomacy was an interior game. It was behind a curtain and secrecies, secrets were kept. And the press was limited. I remember when our State Department spokesman in the mid-90s for, for the Clinton administration, I could go home at 7 at night because the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, they had closed. The evening news, you know, Walter Cronkite, well, he was off the air. And now, of course, um, this is a 24-hour game. So the first thing that President Obama has to consider in a national security crisis is, what do I say to my public? What do I say to the rest of the global community? That was probably 14th on President Kennedy's list yeah. at the beginning of the executive committee in 62. Second, um, I think President Obama has been right to push for openness. And one of his big initiatives in 2009 was, can we make the government more transparent? Can we reduce classification timelines? Maybe not 30 years, but 10 or 15 years, in terms of the time, the dates at which you declassify a, a document. Uh, but governments do have to have some secrets. And we have nuclear codes for our nuclear weapons. We can't make those public, right? And every citizen has a right to know everything the government is doing. And so I think Graham's example is a good one. In a crisis nowadays, the president needs to carve out with a very small circle, smaller than President Kennedy's executive committee, uh, his decision making so that he avoids the possibility of leak. And finally, I'd say, I don't understand this attack on the Obama administration, uh, frankly, uh, by, by Governor Romney and, and and Paul Ryan, that somehow uh, they, the administration has been misleading the public in what happened in Benghazi. I've been in a situation like that, both at embassies and also in Washington. You can't believe the first reports that come in. You do try to establish a sense of what happened in the first 24 hours. You have a duty to communicate that to the public. But if the story changes because your sense of what happened changes, then, of course, you've got to change what you say publicly. I find what the administration has done entirely credible and believable based on my own experience in government. And I'm sorry to see that this situation in the Middle East, the attacks on our embassy has been politicized. This is a time for us to stand together when our diplomats are being attacked. I think it's a grave era of the Romney campaign to try to politicize this. Can we just Way that I remember when Nick was the U.S. ambassador to Greece uh, in Athens, and his house was fired on by an RPG that went through the window and almost uh, hit your family because your wife and children were there. 
And the question was, what, what happened? Well, it was clear that somebody had fired something, and it, it was easy enough to determine. But it took a week more to figure out the, the proposition that at the beginning, there's a, a great deal of confusion. That is, McNamara, rightly said in the quantum war, the first report is always wrong in some significant way. So always to change that. The expectation that then one should be a mission at the beginning is completely unrealistic. And I think that actually we do ourselves a disservice as a society, as citizens, and as, as reporters or newspapers or otherwise, are, are, are suggesting that it could be otherwise. The president is, can't be a bishop. They could possibly know what had happened other than the fact that, thank God, you guys and your, you know, your family survived. As it turns out, there wasn't an RPG fired into our house, but they were, you know, there were great terrorist groups that were threatening us. They did fire some RPGs, luckily not at us, but you know about that. I mean, governments have a right, as you suggested, Julia, to change their minds and not to be called inconsistent because when further information comes in, you have a better appreciation of what is happening. I think that's right. Um, I, before we, I want to ask one final question, and it's a short question, uh, but one that I hope the audience uh, will appreciate. Uh, based on the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you could have 10 minutes with any world leader, any enemy, friend, whoever, in between, uh, and describe or teach them about one day, one moment, one decision during that 13 days, uh, who would it be today, and what would the lesson be? <laughs> and it can't be Castro, because as we learned in the previous panel, he won the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's still around. But you said, yeah, who, who's still here? Yeah. Uh, I remember Khrushchev said he was going to bury us. Kennedy said he was going to bury Castro. Uh, I think Castro was still Castro here. Yeah. So, uh, I, th I, I think that the, 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 uh, the most urgent uh, nuclear challenge on the agenda that day is Iran. And I think Iran's nuclear challenge looks like a Cuban Missile Crisis in slow motion. In the Missile Crisis in 13 days, we rushed up to the edge of a precipice that almost fell over. Here, maybe even the next 13 months, you can see the parties moving inexorably to a confrontation that look a lot like the Cuban Missile Crisis. There in the Missile Crisis, at the last day, the 27th, that was being discussed, Two choices, attack to prevent the missiles being able to fire against the U.S., acquiesce in Cuba becoming a strategic offensive nuclear weapons base. In that last minute, Kennedy became super inventive and developed this package that was being discussed before that included a public deal, a private ultimatum, and a secret sweetener. And that combination was what led to a successful resolution of the crisis. He would have rejected that proposal if you had given it to him the week before. But when he looked over the, the, the precipice and thought about what the consequences of each of the options would be, he became to be invented. I think it's time for the Iranian case, before we get to attack or acquiesce, to become much more inventive about options that will be ugly, that we won't like, that we wouldn't want, that we wouldn't choose, except for the fact that it's better than two other options that are worse. So really, we could design an entire course of the Kennedy School around Juliet's question. But I guess I'd say, I'd say this. Uh, I don't think that Castro was the victor of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he sits as a discredited figure in isolation in a communist country. He's an anachronism. I think President Kennedy is the great hero of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Without him, without his ability to think his way through this and arrive at a decision that most of his advisors told him was not correct, we would very likely have ended up in a catastrophic conflict. So I think he's the hero. What lesson do we draw for Iran? Your question, I want to have 10 minutes with uh, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Hamanai. And if Graham and I could do that meeting together, because Graham is smart at night to keep this crisis. Here's what Graham and I might say to him. What did President Kennedy do correctly to arrive at a successful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis 50 years ago today. He combined diplomacy and force. He was smart enough to say to Khrushchev, I can 
inflict unacceptable military damage on you. But I'd rather us find a way to back off and find some agreement that leaves us both in our countries peaceful. And that's what we've got to do with Iran. I don't think we can allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon and for all sorts of reasons, but I think everyone will understand why. But we should choose to fight them if we can possibly avoid it. Because who knows where that will lead? Who knows if it'll be another 10 year land war in the Middle East with unacceptable losses on both sides? So I'd say to the Ayatollah Hamanai, see what President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev were able to do. They were mortal enemies, and yet they had the human insight to understand that war was unacceptable. Is there some agreement, Mr. Supreme Leader, that you could accept that would allow him to walk away with his pride intact, short of a nuclear weapon that we could accept? And should we do something that we haven't done in 32 years between the United States and Iran? Can we have a conversation that is strategic and sustained? We haven't had such a conversation since the Jimmy Carter administration. We are totally divorced from each other. I, I think Graham and I would both choose that meeting with the Ayatollah Khamenei, and I think the Cuban Missile Crisis gives us a lot of lessons for the U.S. and Iran relationship to avoid war. I think we can do it. Um, I hope so, too. I want to thank uh,